When it comes to the western genre, I think it's safe to say that Rockstar Games have completely re-revolutionized it when it comes to the Red Dead or Red Dead Redemption series. There's just no other open world western themed video games that even come close to them. From Red Dead Revolver that began the series all the way back in 2004, all the way to Red Dead Redemption 2, it sets the bar for open world storytelling atmosphere through the roof. I think I've already made this clear before that I'm a fairly new player to the Red Dead series, starting out with Red Dead Redemption 2 last year and enjoying it a bit. So with this video folks, we're going to be doing something that I haven't seen anyone do on YouTube before yet. Going through in depth and analyzing all of the Red Dead games in the series from gameplay, story, mechanics, everything essentially one at a time all in one video. This is going to be one of my more longer videos, so there will be timestamps if you want to skip to a certain part of the video or you know just watch the whole video. But anyway guys, let's get into this because this video is way too damn long. Now, before Red Dead Redemption, in 2003, Angel Studios, which are now referred to as Rockstar San Diego, had been hard at working at developing a western shooter game that Capcom had to originally begin working on. And this was a kind of western style video game that the world had never really seen before. Released in 2004 for PlayStation 2 and the original Xbox, Red Dead Revolver had introduced players to a unique blend of a 3D person shooting experience set in the Wild West. By this point, many people had already grown accustomed to western video games. Lethal Enforcers 2, Wild Guns, Outlaws to name a few, but Red Dead Revolver focused more on that old school arcade style shooting approach that not many games did. And when Rockstar acquired Angel Studios as Rockstar San Diego and published the game under them, this would evidently become the foundation of the entire Red Dead series. Now putting aside all of the elements of this 20 year old title, I can't expect the game to look like and perform like some of its predecessors. The game is severely outdated when it comes to mechanics, gameplay, graphics, everything essentially. For for this playthrough, I played it on my PlayStation 5, so obviously playing this torn yield game on this kind of harbor leads to some technical issues that I very much noticed, but I digress. Right from the bat when you load into Red Dead Revolver, the game almost immediately gets you sunken into the western atmosphere. Before you even start doing anything, the intro scene pretty much says it all. You observe how utter grainy the resolution is. It has old, dirty static effects plashed on one another. It gives you a mix of spaghetti western vibes and arcade style action gameplay that you you probably see in a 1970s movie. And to accommodate all of this, the music Rockstar uses. The music fits in so well that I generally think it's one of the most underrated soundtracks in the Red Dead series. Of course, all of the music and the Redemption titles are masterpieces, we know that. But Red Dead Revolver's theme is just pure classic western. Every single inch of this game represents cowboy culture. I mean, hell, throughout the entirety of the entire playthrough of the game, it has black bars with grainy effects on it, constantly reminding you that this is a fully fledged western game. Now like I just said, this is a 20 year old PlayStation 2 game, so we're going to be judging everything from its time, taking into account all the aspects like the technology that were used during the time period, but everything else like missions can all be criticized and praised for because those are the main elements of the entire game. We just gotta look at everything subjectively. And just note, I'm not nostalgic for Red Dead Revolver one single bit, so it might sound like I'm just completely crapping on the game, which is not my intention. <laughs> this game looks worse than GTA 2. Yeah, so 20 plus years later, graphically, this PlayStation 2 slash Xbox game is very dated. The controls are very, very janky. Every single movement you make with your controller almost feels too arcadey, which makes for some pretty challenging stuff like shooting. <laughs> And unlike most other games, Red Dead Revolver lacks the ability of using a mini-map, which we can all assume the reason being because this game is centered around arcade style shooting, and this game for the most part isn't actually an open world game that lets you free roam, which truly shows you the game's limitation abilities. Now in Red Dead Revolver, we play as bounty hunter Red Harlow, ironic that the protagonist's name is named after the game's title. 
The main plot of Red Dead Revolver is fairly basic to the typical western game. The game has you follow Red Harlow seeking out revenge on a bunch of outlaws for the death of his parents. It has you doing a bunch of the same type of missions where you're just killing enemies and nothing really more than that. In the beginning of the game, the game will make you do a few training missions to get used to how the shooting mechanic is going to work, which mainly all just make the use of manual aiming. Though there is some aim assist and I couldn't exactly find a way to turn it off because when I play games, I typically like to turn off any sort of aim assist because one, I'm not a virgin and because I just like having a complete control of where I'm aiming at. To start a mission, the game will either just jump you right into one or you will have to physically walk up to start one. Now like how I just said about how this game is an open world and has zero free roaming ability, well there is some sort of free roam if you even want to call it free roam. The only sort of free roam in the game is you being able to wander around the town of Brimstone. Brimstone is basically the main hub where a character can start missions. In this town you can walk into different shops to purchase different weapons like revolvers, go into different shops like the saloon interact with NPCs that will actually interact with you as well. And that's really it when it comes to free roaming. The town is pretty bare bones and lacks any sort of soul and feels very very lifeless. I mean we really only visit this place a handful of times since we mainly just spend our time just jumping from mission to mission in a very linear style format. But I mean what can you really expect? The game has 27 storyline missions and I'd say about 100% of them are pretty much all the exact same. This isn't me necessarily saying it's a bad thing because since the game is so janky and dated in terms of controls and mechanics and just everything, it makes for some pretty difficult and entertaining gameplay that I really despise. A perfect example of this is a very big mechanical issue that I noticed very early on during my playthrough. You know how in most modern games today, when you're taking cover somewhere, the game will allow you to shoot at enemies while being able to still take cover. Welp, in Red Dead Revolver, when you take cover behind a pillar or a rock or just any type of barrier, the game will not allow you to shoot at people from those places. You're not able to return back from fire and immediately like how you can in most modern games today. Instead, you have to manually detach yourself from taking cover by pressing square, then it will let you shoot. And when you want to take cover again, you then have to manually do it again. Which isn't very convenient when you're in the middle of a shootout. And since the game's controls are so clunky and blocky, sometimes when you try to take cover, the game will stall for about 3 seconds, which gives enemies enough time to shoot at you taking a good chunk of your health though. It's things like this that show a clear lack of polish by the devs. Alright, let me not say that because this game was in severe hell during development. More things about this game that makes it annoying is that anytime you get shot at, you lose a ton of health, like an inconsiderable amount of health. But thankfully, the game lets you revitalize your health supply and has checkpoints. I can't tell you how annoying it is when some of these older games don't make use of implementing checkpoints. Yes, GTA 3. I get it that it makes the experience more intense for not to die, and it makes every mission more thrilling, but having to restart the entire mission from the very beginning is not fun at all to me. It kinda just takes the joy out of it. Then again, this is all coming from a 16 year old. Nonetheless, after completing the second mission of the game, we go on to unlock the best mechanic that the entire Red Dead series is known for, the introduction of the Deadeye system. When you go to aim at someone by pressing the right trigger button, the game slows time down and gives you hit markers to shoot at. It has six Six different targets on the enemy's body that it will lock onto, making it the best way to take out a multitude of enemies all at once. And this accounts for duels as well. Most times at the end of a mission, the game will have a mini showdown between you and a powerful boss enemy that we've been trying to take down during the entire mission. The game requires you to manually take your gun out of your holster before your opponent can and use Deadeye to take them down. Yellow indicating a poor shot, red indicating a normal shot, and bright red indicating a critical shot. The shooting in this game can be absolutely abysmal at times, so having this built-in cheat code makes life so much easier for us. These duels are what really give that game that intricate cowboy style. They almost in a way remind me of Toy Story 3. Just me? You then have your typical boss fights where they don't get injured as fast as compared to normal enemies. I don't think I need to explain to you what a boss enemy is. I mean, you guys are competent enough, right? They're fairly difficult to complete since this game is ancient as shit. The game's as compact mechanics are as basic as they get. I mean, after playing Red Dead Redemption 2, they're just yikes. I do like how the game, though, allows you to play as different characters at times. We'll be protecting a woman tied up from a bunch of goons, and then before you know it, we'll be killing a bunch of people inside of a burning barn house that are on top of horses. You're one hell of a bounty hunter, mister. You'd make me one fine deputy. I just want my money. 
If I had to sum up my experience with Red Dead Revolver, most of you guys would expect me to say that the game is trash, which, I mean, objectively, yeah, it is. But I very much enjoyed the old school classic western theme. Yes, the game has very glaring issues and looks really, really good, but it's a very decent introduction to the series. I love the spaghetti western style they went with, which in a lot of ways is sort of what Red Dead Redemption 2 lacked at. I do wish the game was longer or had more content to it, which might come to a surprise of me saying because, once again, I'm a teenager, and typically kids my age don't really mess with these kinds of old games, but I genuinely enjoyed my time with this game. However, I can't personally say if I would recommend that you play it. Because the game is dated in every single way, the controls are scuffed, it's a very linear style based game with no real sort of immersion to it whatsoever, it can very much turn some people off from it. And if you're a fan of more AAA games today, which majority of us are, then you're probably not going to like Revolver. And if you're a true fan of the Red Dead Redemption titles, then you're really not going to like Revolver. Plus, the game has no real correlation to the Red Red Dead Redemption universe. Though Red Harlow and a few characters from the game are mentioned a few times in Red Dead 2 by a few people. Yeah, my brother, he's dead now, but he used to tell me stories about Red Harlow. Yep, you've probably heard of it. Legendary bounty hunter bringing the savage outlaws of the frontier to justice. Man who watched his parents get murdered in front of him as a boy, but who uses that pain to become a better man and ultimately to wreak his vengeance. Which are pretty interesting easter eggs that the devs threw in, implying that Red Harlow and his buddies are just remembered as legends. But Rockstar have stated multiple times that Red Dead Revolver and the Redemption titles are different universes, so you're really not going to be missing out on much. Plus, Gun, which came out a year later in 2005, was pretty much Red Dead Revolver, but better in almost every single way, from just a polishing standpoint, and just more better features and abilities that you can do. But Revolver is very cheap on PlayStation, I got it for 7 bucks when it was on sale, and normally it costs $17, which even that is still very cheap. So if you're broke and want to get the first time experience to say that you beat Red Dead Revolver, then go for it. It's important to know that two years later in 2006, Rockstar San Diego were going to create the powerful Rockstar Advanced Game Engine, or Rage. This beast of an engine would allow Rockstar games to create mind-bending open-world games and revolutionize them to what we know today. They did this with the Grand Theft Auto series, Max Payne, the Midnight Club series, which I have to check out soon, and would do this for the Red Dead series, beginning the second installment two years later in 2006, and from there, the rest is history. Quite literally, Red Dead Redemption was the biggest leap in the entire series, having its foundation established by Revolver in 2004. But unlike Revolver, Red Dead Redemption was vastly different from Mitt in almost every single way. By this point, Rockstar Games had already become a staple when it came to HD open world games, since the Grand Theft Auto series had already gone to that element by 2008 with Grand Theft Auto 4. So this time around, Red Dead Redemption wasn't just going to be a typical 3D person shooter game set in the Wild West with a generic baseline to it. Rockstar had completely revamped it to an open world environment that finally let the player free roam and explore the entire Wild West, then only just being limited to one singular town in the entire game to trigger missions. I think this massive leap can be shown in the first few minutes of the intro scene. It clearly shows the devs shooting for a more intricate scenery with it being more story driven. The way Rockstar introduces all of the characters, the desolate open world, the environment is by far my favorite. The chance to live among people People who are decent and who do not kill each other. Entering Red Dead Redemption, the game is set in the year of 1911, a time period where the Wild West era is coming to an end and where civilization is taking over everything, which is something the intro scene completely nails at showing. We get introduced to former outlaw John Marston, our main protagonist that we're going to be playing as throughout the entirety of the game. What was the point of me having to say that? The game opens up with John Marston on a train coming back from Blackwater, traveling to the town of Armadillo with two of his agents, Edgar Ross and Archer Fordham. Pre Previously, his family was taken away from him and were held hostage by the government and were going to be set free under multiple conditions that John had to take part in that involved him having to hunt down his former outlaw friends that he used to run with back in the day for him to see his family again. This opening section of the game is a mix of excitement and depression in a way. It shows John Marston has basically already lost, the law has caught up to him for all of his crimes that he committed with the Dutch Randerling gang and is now forced back into this harsh lifestyle of being an outlaw that 
that is gonna require him to do all of this dirty work again that he does not want to do anymore. But he has to do it or else his family will be in great harm. And all of this subsequently will get him to even more trouble with the law. The way Rockstar perfects the opening cutscene with its mood is just pure perfection in my opinion. Not a single word is being exchanged, yet you can see how uncontrollable he is in this situation as he's now in the hands of the law, but he still manages to keep a very calm demeanor, showing that yeah, even though his time is up and he's pretty much screwed, he's still not one to be fucked with because well, I mean, it's John Marston. I think I speak for everyone when I say that he's one of the most badass characters in any video game. The way Rockstar develops him when it comes to personality and appearance, displaying him as a rough, sarcastic, angry, and irritated character, mainly because by Red Dead Redemption 1, because again, Red Dead 2 story takes place before Red Dead 1 occurs, so this is after all of the chaos that ensued with the Dutch Vanderling gang, he's already lived that dangerous outlaw life where he robbed and killed people for a living, and was constantly on the run from the law 24-7 pretty much. And after the events of Red Dead Redemption 2 of him breaking away from the Dutch Vanderlyn gang, he's just trying to start a new life and move on from his old past that he hates, and just wants to put all of it behind him pretty much. But like John Marston always says, People don't forget. Nothing gets forgiven. So he's effectively worn out and just pissed off 90% of the time, understandably, and just wants to get all this shit over with. I mean, John Martian is 38 years old in Red Dead 1, so who the hell wants to do that at 38 years old? After we get off the train and arrive in the town of Armadillo, which primarily is one of the last remaining towns in the Wild West in the entire game, we head into a bar to meet a fella named Jake. Jake guides us to Fort Mercer, where John Martian confronts Bill Williamson, former member of the Dutch Vanderlyn gang that we don't really know too much about yet. To be honest, it's really unclear if Rockstar were planning to make another Red Dead Redemption game, considering they don't really go in depth about the actual gang or even the people that John is trying to kill, like Bill Williamson. We have a pretty menacing confrontation with Bill and his men. John is just trying to reason with him for why he does the stuff that he does, to which all this back and forth leads to one of Bill's men shooting John and leaving him for dead. Thankfully, he is rescued since the game would have been like 10 minutes if he wasn't. We're brought to McFarlane's ranch, where John Marston is introduced to Bonnie McFarlane. She tells John that she and another one of her people had saved him, and that he had to pay $15 for it. Of course, John being one broke piece of shit and not having any money, considering he just arrived here, tells McFarlane that he would help her around her ranch to pay off his bill. Which, I actually don't know why she's telling us that John needs to pay money, since John is completely new to the area, but uh, okay. Of course, if you're feeling better, why not take a ride with me later and help me patrol the perimeter? You can earn back some of that money we wasted on doctor's bills. So now, we're in the states of New Austin, which is where McFarland's ranch is located, and holy crap, is the difference between Red Dead Revolver super apparent here? This time around, the characters that we speak to don't just feel like soulless pictures on a screen, they all actually feel like real life human beings with life to them, and actually don't just feel like robots we're speaking to, even though they really just are robots. Right when we meet Miss McFarland, we as the player already know that she's gonna be a prominent character with us throughout the entire rest of the game, and we can make up that assumption in about the first three minutes of meeting her. And it would have come to a surprise that our bond with her would quickly begin very fast. Bonnie McFarlane gives John a tour of the entire ranch. She shows him all the different shops like the general store, doctor's office, the barn, and train station. She then invites John into her house to rest up for the day. I wonder what's gonna go down in the house. Once nightfall hits, she wakes John up abruptly, where it shows John Martian almost reaching down for his revolver and his holster, thinking that there's trouble when he finds out that he doesn't need it, which just shows you the type of environment that he's used to. She tells us that she and John are gonna go head outside to take out any critters that are lurking in the area. This is the first mission where we use our gun and ride our horse at the same time, and for the most part, riding your horse in Red Dead Redemption 1 is almost like driving a car. Now, this might be a personal preference because I played Red Dead Redemption 2 first, so coming into this game, it felt like there was a lot of things that didn't feel right. That's starting with the horse mechanic. Because of how arcadey the handling is, it just doesn't feel like a I'm riding a horse at all. I don't really know how to put it into words. I noticed this a lot when I had to race Bonnie in that one mission, where we had to race around the entire ranch on our horses to build our bond with each other more, and it just felt like I was operating an entire vehicle rather than an actual living horse. I can't be the only one that feels this way. I also noticed in this game, when you're riding your horse with someone, if you start riding faster than them, the person that you're riding with won't ride at the 
same speed as you, then how it is in Red Dead Redemption 2, where the person you're riding with will always ride at the same speed as you. It's pretty annoying, but whatever, to be honest. And to add on top of all of this, I can't help but feel how boring the open world is in this game. To simply put it short, the map in Red Dead 1 is just a giant barren of desert for miles and miles. Of course, this is just how the Wild West looked. It is very, very beautiful to look at, but to play in it for hours and hours on end, it's a very, very dull experience and lacked any sort of variation. Like in the first few hours of my playthrough, I got so damn bored of traveling to places and it looking the exact same no matter what direction I went in. You know, it almost reminds me of that Titanic scene, where Rose is in that hallway looking for Jack, and every direction she looks at, it looks like she's in the back rooms. Good movie, gotta rewatch it soon. And not to discredit Rockstar here, they did a perfect job of displaying how boring the Wild West looked where everything is just a desert nothingness. But from a player's perspective, it's a completely valid criticism to throw when it comes to the open world experience. It's not something that ruins the gameplay for me at least, I know it does for some people, but everything else in the game makes up for it for me. Especially Undead Nightmare. It's just one of those major criticisms that the game is known for. Anywho, back to where we left off before I just started talking shit. We're chatting with shooting a few rabbits and coyotes that were roaming around McFarland's ranch, and I did accidentally shoot one of the dogs that was in the area, so fuck me, I guess. After we complete this little objective, McFarlane assures us that she and her people are gonna make sure they take good care of us and make sure that they get us settled in this area since John is clearly new to this place. We go back to our little house to go to sleep. We're in this game now, sleeping will actually save your progress unless you just turn auto save on, which I didn't know how to do. I also think it's worth mentioning that a lot of the physics and mechanics that were used in this game are mainly reused assets from GTA 4. Things like jumping, shooting, hanging onto ledges, combat, and even of the infamous ragdoll physics that are almost exactly like GTA 4, which I'm not complaining about. GTA 4 or by 4 has the best physics in any Rockstar game. Which this shouldn't be a surprise because the games were made under the exact same engine and were made by the same company, but it was an interesting feature I noticed. I hope this doesn't start a feud between Red Dead and GTA 4 fans. Another interesting feature that this game presents is an honor system. If you do certain acts like kill innocent people, rob stores, and just do violent acts, your honor rank will go down. But if you do good deeds like help people run the ranch, save people, it will go up. Or even in missions, when there's two outcomes you can pick like choosing a spare someone or kill them, each of them will either bring your honor rank up or down. With high honor, NPCs will respect you more, and with low honor, people aren't really gonna take a liking to you very much. Though, we are an outlaw, so you would think that people wouldn't like us either way. This sort of serves as John's level of fame and how much he's respected in the game, which is a neat element that shows you that everything that you do in this game is gonna present a different outcome throughout your playthrough. At times, it can be very annoying because every single thing you do will affect John's level of respect in some sort of way, which in retrospect forces you to think rationally before doing something, which stops cycles like me from just killing anything that breathes. I need to see a therapist. Anyways, after we wake up from the night before, John and Bonnie head back to Armadillo together, so John could go on ahead and pick up some medicine from the doctor's office due to his wounds that he's still healing from. From here, Bonnie leaves us and heads back to the ranch, and for once in the entire game, we can actually explore a little bit of Armadillo. It's not a big town by any means, but kind of like Valentine in Red Dead Redemption 2, it has its own charm to it. It's one of the last remaining true Wild West towns in the entire map, so it fits in extremely well with the entire plot of the game of this era coming to an end. You can do bounty work, purchase different weapons, go into the general store, or you can just play poker. Now around this time of the game when we arrive back in Armadillo, we begin to start working for Marshall Lee Johnson. Our first mission we do for him is help him find a man named Walton who was at a hideout spot nearby. When we ride up there, it would turn out to be our very first shootout with other gang members in the game. Which I can't lie to you, alright, in my opinion, okay, as a Based opinion, I think the gunplay in this game is underwhelming. It's not bad by any means because after all, this is a 2010 game, so expectations have to be realistic, but the gunplay just feels very generic and nothing that special. I do like though how Rockstar implements the use of ambient soundtracks throughout the gameplay. Whenever there's a gunfight about to happen, there's always a very subtle bass soundtrack that begins to play, implying that some shit is about to go down. Or just any sort of mission, badass music will always play in the background that fits within whatever we're doing. Which sets the feeling and mood for the player, unlike Red Dead Revolver where 90% of it wishes utter silence with occasional music playing. We do several tasks with Marshall Johnson, one of them being us clearing out an entire gang at Pike's Basin and rescuing an innocent civilian, to which John and Marshall would begin to start talking about Bill Williamson and what they were going to do about killing him. Now, about Williamson. I'll do what I can. 
You know, as you can see, this country is infested with all manner of scum. Now, after this little ordeal, we meet back up with McFarlane at her ranch. And here, I want to quickly go over how John and Bonnie's bond and trust between each other grows immensely. In this little interaction between the two, John begins to tell Bonnie about his life and past with the Dutch Vanderlyn gang, and how he struggles with trusting people nowadays because of what he's been through, and what he's still going through with the recent events of his family being taken away from him. Up to this point, he hasn't shared any of this information to Bonham to anyone, until he told McFarlane this. Which shows the two really building a strong friendship between between each other and being able to share these kinds of events with each other. Miss McFarland, I'm married. I have a son. I had a daughter, but she died. Years before that, I rode in a gang. We robbed banks, trains, held people ransom. We killed people we didn't like. Bill Williamson was in that gang. Now, if I don't capture my former brother in arms, Great harm will befall my family. This interaction shows us that John really wants to leave his old outlaw life behind him and live a somewhat normal life as the world is evolving, which is the main thing he is struggling with right now. He's already lived a chaotic life before the game The Story even starts, but now he's obligated to do it all over again for the government so he can see his family. So when he's essentially getting roped back into this life that he doesn't want anymore with all these different people that pretty much just use him, his character arc falls flat and is the same from start to finish. But which isn't a bad thing. He's clearly fed up with his lifestyle and just wants it to end. So there really isn't a need for John Marson to have a character arc when his character arc is just him wanting to have a better life with his family, but can't because of the government. It's up to the player to understand his past as to why I feel this way without the game directly telling you, which is very creative and what makes this game's writing amazing. You get the next mission, Old Swillander Blues, where John Marson stumbles upon Nigel West Dickens laying on the ground wounded from something. Or I don't think he was wounded? I don't really know why he was laying on the ground, fat fuck. Nonetheless, we help him up and bring it back to Armadillo and come back the next morning to get properly introduced it to him. We find out that he's a somewhat goofball merchant that sells tonics. He has John help him go around places basically scamming people with his tonic, claiming that it can cure any type of illness, which, you know, doesn't sound like a midlife crisis. But hey, throughout meeting him, we do unlock the dead eye system, which of course is the best mechanic in the entire game that was brought back from Revolver. For me at least, Nigel West Dickens comes across as such a lovable dickhead that does so much stupid shit and is clearly a fraud in almost every way, but his personality is so goofy that it's hard to hate him. Though I'm pretty sure John Martian despises his guts 90% of the time, considering that John despises everyone that he works for, because most of the people that John is working for usually don't really help him for what he actually needs them for. Please, sir, this show of petulance is nothing short of embarrassing. Think for a moment, sir. Think. I'm thinking about how much of my time you're wasting. <laughs> We and Marshall Johnson and the rest of our people are tasked with hunting down some bandits for committing horrible types of crimes, and conveniently, as we're doing this, we run into Bill Williamson and his men on top of a hill, which leads to a very fun encounter with them. You always did have a high opinion of yourself, John. <laughs> Dutch always said you were an arrogant son of a bitch! From here, we begin to start doing a lot of preparation for the attack on Fort Mercer to kill Bill Williamson and his men. The first thing we have to do for preparation is save a guy named Irish in the mission A Frenchman, A Rolfsman, and An Irishman. Which, this was probably the funniest piece of dialogue in the whole game. What's up, boys? <sighs> Fuck off, boy. This don't concern you. When a man with a sing-song voice tells me to fuck off, it always concerns me, boyo. Sing-song voice. Never heard that before. Iris helped us find a mining camp to retrieve a Gatling gun that we're going to use on the attack. Which, this is our first ever time using a weapon this powerful in the entire game. Let's just hope this all doesn't go to shit. After we get some ammunition and meet back up with Marshall Johnson to scout out the area, we begin to head over to execute the attack. It shows Nigel West Dickens bringing in his supposed wagon to show the people to Fort Mercer his tonics, when in reality, Reality, it opens up and it's John Marston with his Gatling gun ready to start taking fire at the people at Fort Mercer. After about a 5 minute gunfight, we find out that Bill isn't here and instead is somewhere out in Mexico with Javier, another member of the Dutch Vanderlyn gang that John has to kill. Javier Escuela. He's gone to see Javier Escuela. That should make things interesting. Where in Mexico? How should I know? Oh! Where in Mexico, you little shit? 
someplace near Chuparosa. After this, John walks out the doors from this massacre, and it concludes the first act of the game. Yeah, I didn't mention, but this game is kind of broken up into four different acts, each of them having their own sort of style and way of story. They're not exactly like Red Dead 2's chapters, but more so just broken up into different sections of the game. The first act is getting us introduced to all of the characters and mechanics that we're going to need to use for the rest of our playthrough, and Act 2 now is when we're in Mexico searching for Bill. Although Act 2 isn't necessarily my favorite part of the game compared to Act 1, Mexico is truly a beautiful place in this game. The mission where we ride into Mexico with the sunset setting with Far Away by Jose Gonzalez playing is truly one of my favorite parts of the entire game. Wish I could play it, but you know, I do like money. Once John arrives in the town of Escalera, we meet Vincente de Santa. Here, John asks him if he can speak to the commander of the area, to which he jokes about killing John for asking that kind of question. Our first task we have to do for him is help him protect the train. This mission was pretty difficult for me because I fucking suck ass. You have to kill a bunch of enemies while trying to stop the train before it goes off a cliff before a collapsed bridge. And off topic, but this game goes above and beyond with the subtitles. Now, I haven't taken Spanish class since like the 6th grade, so I have no clue what they're saying. But every time we meet back up with DeSanta, and all of the cutscenes where he argues with people in Spanish, they sound so funny, but I have no clue what they're saying, considering the subtitles are also in Spanish. Cuando mi cabeza está en pelado, ¿verdad? But nonetheless, most of the missions that we do for DeSanta are pretty much all the same shootout missions. They're not my favorite, as 80% of them just feel like sort of like filler content that they put in. They all follow the same formula of arriving somewhere, killing a bunch of enemies, and leaving. Or surprise attacks that aren't really that much of a surprise attack. But all these chores that we're doing for DeSanta does have a bit of meaning. Because all the stuff that we're doing for him is so John Marcia could find where Avier and Bill whereabouts are, being the main objective of the entire game so far. We do some work for Landon Rickett that has John help him kill off a bunch of bandits, help recover some folk from a wagon, and help save a woman named Louise save her boyfriend Abraham Riez, which involves John killing a bunch of soldiers in the area. Later in the mission, cowards die many times, John Martin arrives at a church where DeSanta had told him Avier was at. Of course, this is Red Dead Redemption, why believe anyone? Avier wasn't there, and this will lead to DeSanta's betrayal on John Marston. For your service to this land. How did he get knocked out from that weak ass punch? The game then pans to John Marston restrained and about to get executed. Luckily, Abraham Riaz has our back and comes to save John Marston. After we retrieve our weapon and take out a bunch of Mexican soldiers, we meet back up with Louise as she reunites back with Abraham. And don't worry because we do kill DeSantis shortly later. Never liked this guy from the first interaction I had with him. We then end up running into Avier in the mission The Gates of El Presidio, which would be our very first interaction with him. Hello, old friend. It's been a long time. Hey. Hello, brother. It's uh, good to see you. I heard you was coming. You took your time, no? Come on, you're not gonna shoot your own brother, are you? We was family. Yeah, we were. You can either kill or hogtie him. I chose to hogtie him because it gives you pretty cool dialogue between you and him. We end up giving Avier over to Edgar Ross and Archer Fordham. And our last thing that we have to do for these two is just hunt down Bill Williamson. And then after that, John should be able to return back to his family. After giving up Avier to these two, we then have to go save Abraham from getting beaten up. Oh no. I don't give a shit. Why the fuck would you run at three men with guns with a knife? Jesus, women, am I right? I'm gonna stop. The game then shows a shot of Bill Williamson and another one of his men trying to escape. Unfortunately for them, John followed the stagecoach and successfully takes out Bill Williamson. Now, this part of the game did feel kind of anticlimactic. Bill and Avier's death kind of just felt rushed to me, as they really only had a few minutes of screen time in the entire game, which kind of just served Act 2 for me as just filler for John trying to get the connection of Bill and Avier, which I guess is not really all that bad. But honestly, who cares to be honest? Honest, because Act 3 of the game is by far my favorite part, because this is where Dutch Vanderlyn comes into place. Act 3 begins with John Martian arriving back into Blackwater. By this point of the game, he's already taken out Bill Williamson and Avier, so this should be where he reunites back with his family. He goes to confront Edgar Ross and Archer Fordham and demands them to give him his wife and son back, since he did what they asked him to do, but they wouldn't, and instead they would demand him to get them Dutch Vanderlyn as one final exchange between the two, using his family as bait again. 
We've done this little deal for your freedom in exchange for all your men from your old gang. You gave us Williamson and Escuela. We still don't have Vanderlyn, but now we know where he is. Then go and shoot him. No, sir. I want you to shoot him for me. If this interaction doesn't make you despise Edgar Ross, then I don't know. By this point, the story is supposed to end here. John does the dirty work for Edgar Ross and Archer Fordham, tracking down Bill and Javier, he kills them, and then gets his family. I mean, that was kind of what the main objective of what the entire game was from the very beginning. But this all goes back to the law having John's life in their hands. It's clear by this point of the game that they're just using John for their own personal gain because they don't want to do the dirty work since they know just how good John Martian is at this type of stuff and they know they can keep on manipulating John into doing this with his family because they know much how John loves his family and they know that they can just keep using John's family for ransom forever. But however we feel about all this BS, we're forced to vent Raj and attack Dutch's men in multiple ambush sightings. And while we're searching for Dutch, we meet a fella named Harold McDougal, another character that is going to ride along with us. Later on, we end up going to a snowy area to look for Dutch, taking out his men along the way. And when we take all the mods, we finally get our first glimpse of Dutch Vanderlyn in Red Dead Redemption. Our first glimpse of him is him shooting a policeman in the head before looking up at us and turning the gun on John. We're safe thanks to McDougal and we escape the area. When we get back to Blackwater, it shows McDougal packing up his stuff in hopes of leaving this place. But as he's doing this, a window smashes right next to us where it shows Dutch Vanderlyn outside the building, threatening us. Hello Dutch! <laughs> I think that's what they call two for the price of one out here in this wonderful place. Lisa, what are we going to do? I'm gonna hand you over to him and watch him tear you limb from limb. What? Okay, John, what was the point of saying that? This leads to John and McDougal escaping on top of the roof before fleeing with their horses. We say our final goodbyes to each other after arriving at the train station, and we both go our separate ways. Then, in one of the best missions, Great Men Are Not Always Wise, which that mission title quite clearly describes the entire game, we meet back up with Edgar and Archer. They tell us that Judge is at a bank that we need to go intervene at. We get on top of the rooftop on top of the town hall and begin to take out a bunch of Dutch's men. Once we march our way into the bank, we have a pretty menacing encounter with Dutch. It shows him holding a woman hostage. He begins asking John about Jack and Abigail before he then just shoots the woman in the head. <laughs> After Dutch kills this woman, we, Archer, and Edgar go after to chase Dutch while killing more of his men along the way. We end up getting to him in the mission The Truth Will Set You Free. We arrive by Dutch's compound, taking out a wave of his goons. We shoot a lantern that catches the structure that Dutch is standing on on fire, and this allows us to make our way up and come face to face with Dutch near a cliff. Our time has passed. Yeah. So now, after finally taking down all three of these people that the government wanted us to take down, John is now able to return back to his wife, Abigail, and Jack, and uncle. Wait, why is uncle here? Oh, wait, that's right. Uncle's goaded. Forgot, sorry. But like I said, this is by far my favorite part of the game. The game portrays Dutch as this vile, evil, degenerate person that does horrible stuff without any second thought, and killing Dutch finally feels like an accomplishment than how it was killing Bill and Javier, considering that Dutch is the last antagonist that John needs to kill for him to get his family back from the government. I thought he was dead, John, huh? Where you been? Where you been? You know where I've been, darling. And surprisingly, and this is actually kind of funny that Rockstar Games threw in, there's a time where Abigail suspects and accuses John of cheating with Bonnie McFarlane, which I'm sorry, but why would you accuse him of that? We got a telegram from some lady friend of yours, a Bonnie something or other. Something you ain't telling me? Bonnie McFarlane. She's a friend. Mm. Saved my life when I went after Bill and nearly got myself killed again. Oh, and now you two's in the habit of sending each other letters. How very nice. Ah, uh, yes. You can't even talk to females without getting accused of cheating. I mean... Isn't that just real life, guys? But Abigail gets introduced to Bonnie when we ride back up to the ranch to drop off some sacks. And the game shows Abigail being very jealous at Bonnie. But I mean, who wouldn't, to be honest? I mean, look at Bonnie. She looks amazing. After we help Bonnie unload these sacks for her, we and Abigail say our goodbyes to her and ride off. And that would actually be the last time that John would ever see Bonnie McFarlane. Damn. 
this is what being kidnapped does to a person. This scene in a way kind of makes you feel bad for Bonnie. From the very beginning of the game, she took John Marston in after saving him, taking him in as one of her own people, and completely caring for him and taking a really big liking to him as a person. They had several personal conversations with each other about stuff they never told anyone about, which really did show the two building a strong bond heavily with each other. She's definitely one of my favorite characters in the game as she heavily shows loyalty to people like John and is just overall a good character that treats him well. The rest of the game mostly consists of John building his bond back up with Jack since I mean he hasn't done anything with his family yet. We go hunting with him and teach him to shoot a gun even though he doesn't need any help with it. You're holding it wrong. Here let me show you. I don't need you to show me Paul. I guess not. Don't show me and you'll just, you'll just run off again or something. It's better I teach myself. I ain't going nowhere. And towards the end of the game, there's then this really interesting final conversation that John and Jack have with each other. So, uh, you ever hear talk about them machines that can make a man fly? Well, sure, Paul. Everybody knows about that. You know, they're going to be bringing one of those machines around the country next year for a demonstration. One of them machines can turn men into angels. One of them machines can turn men into angels. Which if you don't already know, that was what the woman on the train had said from the very beginning of the game. Talking about how civilization is completely taking over the wild west. Just that attention to detail that pretty much only Rockstar can accomplish. Shortly later after this interaction, Uncle then notices trouble in the distance and lets John know about this. When he realizes that it's US soldiers coming after him, he tells Jack to get inside and lock all the doors with Abigail. Followed by him escorting Jack and Abigail on top of the horse to escape from the ranch and doing this he tells them not to look back keep riding and don't look back hmm i wonder where he got that phrase from after he sends jack and abigail away he peeks through the barn doors and sees all of the soldiers ready with their guns drawn at him he then just buzzed through the doors and the game lets us use deadeye for one last time to kill them but yeah um <laughs> Yeah, what was the point of giving us dead? I think if we could save ourselves in this situation. I think this scene just shows how badass and dangerous John Martian is in this game. They have to have damn near an entire army of people to take out one single man. Also showing you that John Martian is not afraid at all. He had the opportunity to just run off with his family, but he didn't because he cares a lot about the well-being of his family, and he knew if he would have ran off with them, then he would have been putting his family in a significant amount of danger again because of just who he is and the amount of crimes he's committed. So he chose a ladder instead and just decided to face the reality of his problems head on. After the gunfire, Jack and Abigail return back to the barn to see John's body. And from here, the game cuts to a few years later where we now play as Jack in the epilogue. In the epilogue, Abigail is dead, leaving only Jack Marston to run the ranch. In one sort of last revenge, Jack goes off to track down and kill Edgar Ross, the man who evidently got John killed by using his family as bait to get Dutch for them. After killing Edgar Ross, there are some other side quests in the epilogue that you can do like tumbleweed and bounty hunting, but those are all completely optional. But with that, that was Red Dead Redemption. I'll be honest with you guys, coming into this game blindly, I had my doubts with this 2010 game thinking that the story and the overall gameplay wouldn't hold up today, but damn. Was I wrong? I can say 100% that this game is an absolute masterpiece. Aside from the blocky arcade style control schemes that I talk shit about, Red Dead Redemption manages to outclass a lot of other open world games when it comes to the deep level of storytelling and just the mood that Rockstar uses that brings the player closer to the protagonist in his journey. There were many times where I grew sick and annoyed of doing all these different favors and getting used from all these different people and just how annoying it was to me. But guess what, John is also having to go through this as well. It just feels like I'm connected to his entire experience of him just getting his loved ones taken away from him and having to do all this dirty work that he does not want to do anymore but has to unless he wants to see his family again. And I feel like the story hits harder after playing Red Dead Redemption 2 because now it's tying up all of the loose ends that we got a glimpse of from that game and now we're playing through the aftermath of it. But Red Dead 1 story is damn near a 10 out of 10 for me. Not saying it's the best because it's my own opinion but for me I love the story very much. And I also just love the setting of the Wild West era declining in this game. Of course the Wild West is very bare bones when it comes to the actual world design 
and Red Dead Redemption was a bit of an eyesore when it came to traveling to places and it just being miles and miles of desert nothingness, but there were many parts of the game where the immersion was very conspicuous, Mexico being a good example. Red Dead Redemption had quite literally expanded on everything that Rockstar Games had already done by this point in 2010, taking the deep storytelling from GTA 4, taking all of the fun, batshit crazy gameplay from San Andreas, and creating one giant massive game accommodated with all these features. The game is playable on both Xbox Series X and PlayStation 5, which is where I played it on. And if you're asking me, I would honestly just wait till it goes on sale because to be honest, Rockstar didn't even bother remastering this 13 year old game and just ported it over to these platforms for $50. It's a very controversial move that Rockstar got a bunch of shit for, but besides that, the game is definitely 100% worth it. And, of course, this wouldn't be a full Red Dead retrospective if I didn't include its DLC, Undead Nightmare. Coming into Undead Nightmare after finishing up the base game, I had my expectations low with this DLC and thought it was just gonna be Red Dead Redemption but with zombies and nothing more, nothing else. Which it is, but you, you know what I mean. I had a feeling that it was just gonna be one of those overdone, generic Walking Dead style games fit into a cowboy environment with not much substance. As I'm not particularly much of a fan of zombie games or movies these days myself since for how oversaturated and overdone they've gotten now but Damn, was I wrong, Rockstar. Undead Nightmare is so much more than just zombies. In Red Dead Redemption, you're trying to get your family back by going around and killing people that you're assigned to by the government. In Undead Nightmare, there's an entire zombie outbreak, your family gets infected and becomes zombies, and you're trying to find survivors in different towns all across the map, while trying to find a cure for this crazy apocalypse. This DLC features some of the most wild and entertaining gameplay I've ever witnessed. This DLC quite literally keeps you on your feet 24-7, Wherever you are, zombies can just sneak up behind you while you're not looking and catch you completely off guard, which the first time scared the absolute shit out of me. The overall plot of this DLC fits exactly into Rockstar's kind of humor. The humor is exaggerated much, much more. The premise is clearly not meant to be taken seriously since it's about zombies. The gameplay is meant to be silly and batshit crazy, but fun at the same time, something that many games feel to capture correctly. Undead Nightmare is obviously not canon to the base game because it would make no fucking sense, but it does take place after the events of John Marston killing Dutch and arriving back to his wife Abigail and Jack, as the opening cutscene of the game is John coming back to reconnect back with his family at their ranch, but theoretically, it's set in an alternate universe of the Red Dead Redemption storyline. John Marston has returned to his loved ones. While trying to rebuild his ranch and win back the trust of his family. I've gotta say, the opening cutscene where John Marston arrives back to his family is probably one of the funniest shit I've seen in a Rockstar game yet. It shows Abigail and Jack cracking jokes at each other, followed by John arriving home. He mentions how there's something strange going on outside, saying how there's dogs going crazy, wolves howling, and birds flying away everywhere. Something funny's going on out there. Damn dogs going crazy. Wolves howling and birds flying. Well, it's just the storm, John. John then asks Abigail if Uncle made it back safely, to which she says that she doesn't know because why the hell would Abigail know anything? Right after John says this, the game then cuts to a zombie right outside of their house, which the zombie being Uncle. He obviously didn't make it back safely. And I've gotta say, the music Rockstar uses and the way they all look at the window is just like the most stereotypical setting of any corny horror movie. I hope so. Well, that old man can take care of himself. We end up forgetting about it and just head to sleep because, you know, that's a good idea. While we're sleeping, Uncle somehow manages to get in the house and wakes both Abigail and John up. Abigail doesn't do shit to help besides just scream. In self-defense, John grabs a lantern and smashes Uncle right on the head, knocking him unconscious. While he's down on the ground, John runs outside to his cabin and grabs his rifle. And when we return back to our house, Abigail is getting chased by Uncle, to which she falls on the ground like every female does in every single horror movie. And she gets bitten right on the neck. We do shoot Uncle in the head, but by the time we get to Abigail, it's already too late. John then calls Jack, to which Jack comes outside to check on his mom, to which Abigail bites him in the neck, and from here, they both become zombies. So now we have to hogtie them and restrain them and bring them back into the bedroom, where from here, we have some pretty funny dialogue. Now, I don't know what the hell's gotten into you sick, crazy bastards or what else was done to you, but I'm going to get help. Stay calm. Calm as you can, seeing as both of you seem to have gotten a little excited. Probably just a fever. Jack, be kind to your mother. Abigail, teach the boy right from wrong. Both of you. 
Stop biting chunks out of people. I love how unfazed John Martian is during this whole situation. His wife and kid both became zombies, and it's like he just doesn't give a fuck. But it shows you how silly Rockstar went with the plot of it, not taking it too seriously. The base game was already very grounded and serious enough, so they wanted to create a more fun expansion to it that would be more humorous for the player, that would give them some laughs for how stupid and corny the premise can be at times. They mainly just wanted to disconnect for a minute from the super depressing story. And I think this opening section set the tone for the whole game's as goofiness. After we lock these two morons in the house, we venture out to find what the hell is going on. And pretty much everything about this DLC is just so much more different than Red Dead Redemption. Places like Blackwater, New Austin, and McFarland's Ranch look completely different, and are basically all infested with zombies now. But hey, don't worry, because we do meet back up with Bonnie. Thank God she didn't die. First hell walks the earth and you turn up. Could my week get any worse? <gasps> Nice to see you too, Miss McFarlane. Oh, I thought you'd be dead. Man, how would Abigo feel about this? Everything about the DLC just gives off that eerie, spooky feeling, kinda. Not that it's supposed to be scary, because zombies at the end of the day just aren't that fucking scary, but it has a much more different theme than Red Dead Redemption. Some of the more notable changes to things that this expansion adds are the use of torches. Using torches in this DLC is almost a requirement. We mainly use them to burn down graves to stop zombies from reappearing everywhere, which is pretty much how this outbreak began in the first place. Or instead of using torches, we can just throw Molotov cocktails at them and burn them from there. There's new secret locations throughout the map that we can explore. The open world environment is much more diverse and interesting than Red Dead Redemption's map, which thank God for that. There's a plethora of fun side quests that involve you tracking down missing people and bringing them back to safety. The honor system isn't much of a factor in this DLC than how it was in the base game, where every single thing that you did affected the gameplay for you in some sort of way. So you don't have to worry about doing certain acts for respect, you can go around and just shoot people, just shoot whoever you please. I mean, even if there was an honor system in Undead Nightmare, it would make zero sense because, I mean, what respect would you be getting? Everyone's dead and are now zombies. Another apparent difference in this game is that every time that you complete complete a mission, instead of always getting money in return, the game rewards you with ammo that you can use, which is kinda unfulfilling because it's like, we're doing all of this just for ammo, not any profit. But at the same time, if we did get money, it would be kinda pointless because we would have jack shit to spend it on. All of the towns are deserted and have been ransacked. And when it comes to the actual zombies in the game, surprisingly, there's actually a good variety of them. You have fresh undead, which are your standard zombies that you encounter very, very early on in the game. There's nothing really special about them. They're just dummies that run directly at you, giving you enough time to take them out. You then have Bolters. These are probably the- I think they are the fastest type of zombies in the entire game. They crawl like literal skinwalkers and are a pain in the ass to take out when they get up close to you. When I first saw these things, I deadass was like, what? the hell is that? You then have wretchers that will stun John Martian if they shoot their green stuff at him. And finally, you get bruisers. These lot are fat and slow but are the strongest zombies and hardest to take down in the game, so you better make sure you're loaded with ammo because you're gonna need it. And this wouldn't be a zombie game if it didn't include zombie animals. For the most part, the entire wildlife has been transformed into undead creatures. You get undead bears, undead bats, cougars, dogs, even fucking horses. You can pretty much find undead horses anywhere on the map. You can semi-control them and it is pretty fun riding them around, but since they're completely zombified, most of the time they'll go in the complete opposite direction than you want them to go. But that's to be expected since you're riding an undead horse. I will say though, my only issue with this game is that most of the times the missions aren't straightforward enough. Like when I was playing, I kept getting mixed up with the side missions and the main storyline missions. Like I don't know if I'm just an idiot or not, but I mean fucking probably yeah. But overall, this DLC is an absolute blast. I do know many people, like myself included, aren't fans of the zombie genre just for how overdone and saturated it's gotten nowadays, but give Undead Nightmare a playthrough at least once. There's no other game like Undead Nightmare that features an entire zombie outbreak captured in the Wild West environment. This expansion brought that absurdity sense of humor that Red Dead Redemption quite frankly was lacking in a lot of ways. Rockstar needed to add something that would deviate from that sad depressing mood, which was exactly what they did with Grand Theft Auto 4 with its two DLCs. I guess if you're the one not to like Red Dead Redemption's gritty mood, then I suppose Undead Nightmare will give you that ridiculous side that you're looking for. It's not a half ass expansion that they threw in just so they could call it a DLC. You can tell they went all in with it, throwing in all their classic humor that they're all known for. You know, I wish they did expansions more nowadays. I'm really sick of GT Online.
Red Dead Redemption is the longest gap between any mainline release for Rockstar Games, five long years from when GTA 5 released in 2013. Though I'm sure nowadays, due to the high demand for high quality games, waiting five years feels like nothing. But it wouldn't be a surprise that this long stretch of time would eventually be worth it in the end, when trailers began going around for RDR 2. It was clear that this was going to be Rockstar Games' as biggest, as detailed, and immersive piece of media that the world would ever see at this point in the gaming space. Comparing the graphics to real life, I think it's safe to say that it's hard to differentiate them. And quite frankly, I think me just saying that Red Dead 2 was one of the most hyped games of 2018 would be underplaying it massively. Since you've also got to remember that it's been a whopping 8 years since Undead Nightmare came out in late 2010, so the hype for Red Dead 2 was off the charts to say. I think what Rockstar Games do a fantastic job at is when it comes to releasing their games. They don't just pump all their games left and right. In contrast, studios like Ubisoft feel the need to set extremely hard deadlines on the devs, and willingly cut out content just to make those deadlines. Which is why most of Ubisoft games often come out crap and mediocre and just don't meet fans' expectations. Unlike Rockstar games that make their fans wait and wait and wait until it's the right time to show off their work, going as far as delaying their games just so that it's the best possible thing that they can make, showing how much they actually care about actually making good games and putting quality over quantity. But with that out of the way, let's finally jump into Red Dead Redemption 2 to see what sets this game above most other open world games. Now, when you think of classic western games or movies, you often think of small towns with one main road in the middle of them, located in the middle of deserts for miles and miles in tumbleweed areas. Well, in Red Dead Redemption 2, we get a sense that that won't be the case anymore. The opening prologue presents itself in a snowy, cold, chilly environment, which is damn near the complete opposite of what you thought a Wild West environment would be in. And this is the case for the entire game, which thank god Rockstar did this. I complained about how in the first Red Dead Redemption, about 90% of the map is just a desert nothingness as far as the eye can see, and Rockstar Games completely revamped the wild left setting in Red Dead 2, and I really do love it. It's so much more interesting having these snowy, swampy, lush areas with wilderness scattered across the entire map, really giving the game a fantastic amount of variation and variety, and not just a constant eyesore. Red Dead 2 kicks off 12 years before the first Red Dead Redemption storyline occurs. This time around, we're now in the Dutch Vanderlyn gang, and are now going to be observing and unraveling how the gang was before it disintegrated. In this opening section, the gang is currently on the run from the law as if they had robbed the bank in Blackwater that had gone completely wrong, showing us how cold and miserable they are hiking up these freezing storm mounts to evade the law. The game doesn't fully explain to us in depth on what or how the bank robbery went, but all we know is that a few members from the gang were killed and didn't make it back. Here, we get reintroduced to Dutch Vandalin and Javier, and some more newer characters, Hosea, Micah, and instead of playing as John Marston, we step in the shoes of Arthur Morgan. Arthur! Any luck? I found a place where we can get some shelter. After freezing in the mountains, Arthur would lead the gang to an old mining town that he had found along the way, after a judge had sent him off to look for somewhere to camp out at. From here, the gang would all settle in a temporary camp for the time being, and from here we get reintroduced it to a few more characters like Abigail and a more level-headed Bill Williamson though he's he's still kind of crazy in this game. There's obviously a lot of newer faces in the gang that we haven't seen before, but we progressively get introduced to them throughout missions, so I won't be spending too much time going over all of them right now. After getting everyone settled in the cabin, Arthur, Dutch, and Micah both head out into the snow to look for supplies for the gang. And I think here, I'll go over a little bit about the changes of the horses in this game. The game throws us into riding our horses in the snow of Dutch and Micah, and boy, are the mechanics different than the first Red Dead Redemption game. Instead of feeling like cars to get you from point A to point B, they now feel like actual horses with weight to them, and don't just feel like they weigh 2 pounds. The way Arthur bobs up and down while riding it, pause, the way the horses move, run, the way the game has it to where your horse has a mind of its own, where if you're riding in one direction, the horse will veer off to somewhere else than where you want it to go. The game also integrates a bonding system, where you're forced to take care of your horse by feeding and cleaning it, which if you consistently do these actions on a daily basis, then you'll reach the maximum bonding level, which actually makes it feel like you have a strong connection with your horse, than how it was in Red Dead 1, where your horse is just there as transportation and nothing else, which this feature is one of my favorites in the entire game. It makes traveling everywhere so much more worth it, because instead of driving cars that you have no personal connection with, you spend the most time with your horse, and the connection and bond that you build with it 
makes it amazing. But anyways, while we're riding through the snow, we stumble upon an old house in the middle of a forest. Dutch tells Arthur and Micah to hide somewhere so that the people in the cabin don't get intimidated by three degenerates. That's literally just what Dutch said. You two, get yourself out of sight. One lonely man is a lot less intimidating than three nasty looking degenerates. Once Arthur and Micah take cover, Dutch greets the people in the house and begins to introduce himself to them. This would eventually become our first encounter with the O'Driscoll boys. The O'Driscoll boys are one of the six rival gangs in the game that we encounter a lot during our playthrough. And as Dutch is talking to them, Micah spots a body in a wagon that he's right next to, and we can begin to start sensing that something is very off. This would eventually lead to one of the O'Driscoll boys getting shippy with Dutch and resulting into an all-out shootout. And this brings me to the gunplay, and god damn has the shooting gotten a massive overhaul. I'm not saying that it's perfect, but they are a massive improvement from their previous games. Every single gun that we use all feel like they have weight to them and feel unique and different from one another. In games like GTA 5, all the guns that we use feel the exact same, and lacking in sort of variation and almost feel like toys in a way. I don't know how the shooting is on console because I play Red Dead 2 on my computer, but on PC specifically, shooting with the mouse feels so superior than pretty much any other game I played on console. No offense to console players. After taking out all of the O'Driscoll boys, we head into the cab but to loot everything. And you'll notice that when you loot things, it's much, much more slower, and it's driven in a way to an actual person reaching down and picking stuff up. I do know that many people find it annoying just for how slow everything is, but for me, I just admire how real it feels. I mean, just the animation of Arthur opening cabinets and grabbing stuff is just so cool in my opinion. Once we finish looting the house, Dutch tells Arthur to go investigate the barn to see if he could find anything in it. Right when Arthur gets about halfway in it, the Driscoll who was hiding it comes out and attacks Arthur, and we're tasked with beating the crap out of him. Combat in this game isn't much different than the combat in GTA, the only difference being that the punches feel more significant. From the sound effect to the person falling on the ground, it's more practical and feels more realistic. But aside from those things, it's not really much different. Once we beat the shit out of this O'Driscoll, Arthur presses him and asks him where Colmo Driscoll is, who we find out is Dutch's former outlaw friend and is the leader of the entire O'Driscoll gang. You're given the choice to either kill or spare him. I spared him because this was my third playthrough and I was going for a high honor run for this video, so I just let him go. Upon arriving back at the house, we see Micah terrorizing Sidney Adler, someone who had gotten kidnapped by the O'Driscoll gang and had her husband killed. And this was kind of where I just did not like Micah. This dude is acting very, very rapey if you ask me, to someone who had just gotten kidnapped and held hostage. Oh, look what I found in the cellar! Wild thing, ain't ya? <laughs> Leave her alone! I wasn't doing nothing! She's one of them O'Driscolls! No, she ain't, Micah! Look at her! Miss! Miss! Though I believe the game did this on purpose, they wanted you to think that he's some weird degenerate person right from the get-go for just terrorizing a random woman who got held hostage against her will, which I, I mean, they did a good job of showing that. And Micah terrorizing Sadie would lead to him setting the cabin on fire, which this cabin actually belongs to Sadie, so he effectively just burned down her entire house. So we take her out of the house and take her in as one of our own gang members, and as we're riding away, we get a nice glimpse of the cabin being burned to crisps. He was my husband. After returning back to the camp and bringing Sadie back with us, we had to sleep for the rest of the night. And when we wake up, the game jumps us straight into the next mission. That mission being to go out and save John Marston, as he hasn't been seen in days since the Blackwater robbery. Arthur at first is reluctant to go out and search for him, considering it's a very dangerous task, but Abigail begs us to, so we head out with Javier to find him. I think I should preface this by saying that chapter 1 in this game mainly serves as tutorial missions. All of the missions have you learning and getting familiar with all the different controls and mechanics that you're gonna be using during the entire playthrough. And I'll tell you straight up that chapter one is very slow in terms of gameplay and character development. So if you're a new player, don't go into it expecting fast-paced gameplay like GTA because that's how I went into it on my first playthrough and I literally almost quit the game. Nonetheless, when we get to the area where John was last seen, we hear him shouting for help somewhere in the distance. Upon arriving to him, he looks, well, like shit. He's bloody, beat up, weak, and freezing to death. Probably also starving because he's been lost for two days. And you'll also notice that on John, 
Ron's face, he has a giant scar in his cheek. And you'll know that this is the exact same scar that he had in Red Dead 1. So now we finally know how he got the scar in the first place, him being attacked by wolves, which truly shows you the attention to detail of this game. Once we rescue John Marston and get ready to head back to camp, a bunch of wolves begin to try and attack us. Now this part was very fun. Not for the fact that I get to slaughter animals, but because this was the first time where we get to kill things while riding our horse. <laughs> After bringing John Marston back to camp, we're left alone for the time being, where we can now freely roam around the area. And I don't think I've properly gone over the changes that has been added to this game. And I guess we'll just start there. And Jesus Christ, there is a lot. First of all, this 5 year old game damn near beats every other game graphically. When you walk around inside and outside, you can see very visible cracks in the floor and on the walls, to even tiny particles scattered across all over the snow. And just by walking outside with the wind howling and the snow blowing everywhere, you can see Arthur's clothes moving as well. You'll also notice that when you walk around camp, we can hear our gang members having full-blown conversations between each other, which was something that I didn't even pick up until around chapter 2. When the storm breaks, we move. But we're safe here. Warm enough. Of course, I can't possibly go over every single detail in this game simply because we'd be here forever and because there's just so many to list. But one more thing that I will say is that since this game is taking place in the early 20th century, the humor at times could get a bit racist. How come Arthur gets a room and I get a bunk bed next to Bill Williamson and a bunch of darkies? Though I'm glad that a Rockstar wasn't afraid of throwing this kind of humor in fear of offending some folks. Considering historically, Rockstar games have never been the type of company to walk on eggshells with their humor, so I'm glad that didn't hesitate to do with Red Dead 2. And to be honest, I'm surprised they didn't have any white people in the game calling a black person the hard R. Now that would have been funny. You lot have all turned yellow. Apart from you, of course. Shut up, Micah. Something tells me he's not acting. There's obviously more details to be covered visually about this game, but we'll go over more of it as we progress with the story. The next thing that we do is meet back up with our gang. Dutch informs us that we're gonna go on ahead and take down the O'Driscolls once again. He tells us that the O'Driscolls are planning a train robbery and that they must go ahead and stop them before they can do so. On our right there, we have some pretty interesting dialogue between Arthur and Dutch. We find out that Dutch had actually killed Calm's brother, which resulted in Calm killing Annabelle someone who meant a lot to him. The game doesn't tell us really who Annabelle is or what relationship that she and Dutch had together, but it was someone who Dutch really liked. And when Calm killed her, it resulted in the two absolutely despising each other's guts. Once we arrive at their hideout, we scout out the area and see Calm O'Driscoll for the first time. We go in guns blazing and absolutely maul all of the O'Driscoll boys down. Once we take most of them out, we go in and steal their train robbery plan that they were originally planning on doing before we came in and stopped them. This train that Dutch wanted to Rob belonged to Leviticus Cornwall, a very powerful man in the game who was a member of the Pinkerton Detective Agency. And Dutch, knowing this, decides that it would be a good idea for the entire gang to go up off this train heist for a big score. This is something about the train they was gonna rob. A Mr. Leviticus Cornwall. Mount back up. Let's keep moving. Yeah, that's a good idea, Dutch. As we're heading back to camp after taking out the O'Driscolls, Dutch spots a potential O'Driscoll nearby river, Kieran. Arthur goes after him and catches him, bringing him back to camp. Where are you taking me? Somewhere you ain't gonna like. Why? What are you gonna do to me? Something you ain't gonna like. So I'd advise you to save your breath for screaming. It's important to note that Kieran isn't an O'Driscoll. He was actually kidnapped by them unwillingly and had no sort of involvement with them. But Dutch and them don't know this and just assume that he's an O'Driscoll boy and they just treat him like absolute shit. Even with Kieran pleading to them that he's not an O'Driscoll, they don't believe him. I mean, hell, they just hang him on a tree and leave him there starving. But you'll see throughout the game that Kieran is a very reliable person since he knows so many people from the O'Driscolls and he does help Arthur and the gang find different clues on certain hideout spots for where Colm is, making him an innocent person that was incredibly misunderstood in the beginning by the Dutch Vanderlyn gang. And as I progress with the story, I really did take a big liking to him. Because I mean, there's just not really anything you can hate him for. He helps us, he's nice to a bunch of people that basically treated him like garbage, and he just wants to be civil unlike the rest of us. But anyways, after bringing him back to our camp, we then get the next mission where we go hunting with Charles to stock up on some food for our gang. I can't stay here listening to you two. Look, if this game in those hills, I'll find it. And you can kill it. You need to rest, Charles. 
You think this is rest? Charles is probably the most down-to-earth character in the entire game, unlike people like Micah and Dutch. He's written as one of the more chiller members of the gang, one who thinks logically, and one who is capable of keeping their emotions under control in certain situations. Whenever someone is acting out of line, he'll be the first one to call them out on their BS. We venture out with them to the forest to shoot a few deers to collect this food. Hunting in this game for the most part is pretty straightforward. You can either skin them or just take them back as one piece, and I will say, since that this game's graphics are tough, top tier, skinning animals sometimes can just be a little too realistic. And later in the game, you can go to a bunch of different butchers around town to sell a different parts of animals' body for money. Though we're not able to do that in chapter 1 just yet, because we haven't found an actual town, since we're just in a small little camp area for the time being. Now, our next big task that we have to do is rob Leviticus Cornwall's train, which in return would get us a boatload of money. Now, people like Hosea, who is Dutch's oldest friend, warns him that this is not a good idea, because if they rob this train, their lives quite literally will be under the chopping block 24-7. But he just dismisses Hosea's concern and just goes along with his plan. Why are we doing this? The weather's breaking, we could leave. I, I thought we was lying low. Yeah. Come on! What do you want from me, Hosea? So we and the gang just set off to do this train heist. Dutch's original plan is to blow up the train and rob it from there. When we arrive at the scene, we see Bill Williamson setting up the explosive. After Arthur helps him finish setting it up, we find out that the explosive to fail to go off in time, leading to us having to chase after the damn train. This is a pretty good mission, we have to kill a bunch of Cornwalls' men, and have to stop the train, where from here we're going to rob and loot the entire place. To which when the gang leaves, we're then given the choice to either kill or let them go. Obviously I let them go because high on a playthrough, you already know the vibes. And you've probably guessed, since we obviously just killed all of Cornwalls' men and robbed an entire train from him, we have to relocate somewhere else so that the Pinkertons don't find and kill us. So at the end of chapter Chapter 1, the gang begins relocating from Coulter and settling in Horseshoe Overlook, a hideout spot to lay low and hopefully stay out of sight from any Pinkertons and Odriscolls. But you'll find throughout the game that we relocate a lot due to the harsh lifestyle we live in. But with that, that concludes Chapter 1 of the game. So far, we've gotten a great taste of what this game is like. We see that this game isn't just an ordinary western game, exceeding the expectations of realism and story development in almost every single way, while also breaking down every single inch of the characters that we meet and just the gang as a whole before it fell apart before the events of the first Red Dead Redemption. Now, chapter 2 and 3 are some of the more fan favorites and some of my personal favorites. So much stuff happens in these chapters, and it seems like that these are the only chapters where the gang is at its all-time peak in terms of bonding and being loyal to one another. Chapter 2 begins with Uncle, Arthur, Tilly, Kieran, and Mary Beth taking a trip down to Valentine. Valentine in Red Dead 2 is a small, growing livestock town located a few minutes away from where their camp is. In Valentine, you can find yourself by buying different horses at the staple, though I've kept the same horse since chapter 2, the White Arabian horse, which is the best fucking horse in the entire game. You can buy alcohol, buy things from the general store, participate in bounty hunting, purchase and customize your weapons to your liking, and just so much more. And I already briefly talked about how our gang members have pretty cool dialogue between each other. Well, in these towns, the attention to detail for every single NPC and just the open world of this game is damn near perfect. Shit, it might just be perfect. Walking around anywhere, you can see NPCs living their own lives. They all have their own unique dialogue and voices, and don't just feel like they're copied and pasted across the entire map. Hell, even when you're just strolling around, 95% of the time you will always stumble upon some NPC needing help and you having to give them a ride back to their house. Which I always do these things because it makes the world feel so much more lively. But of course, sometimes it could get a bit chaotic. Because most of the time, bounty hunters roam around the map 24-7, so sometimes you'll find yourself having to deal with a bunch of bounty hunters all the time. Just for the love of god, just make sure they don't kill your horse. Because during my second playthrough, one of the bounty hunters killed killed my beal and I literally almost took a 6 month break. And before we get back to the story, I also can't help but feel how well done Rockstar made the nighttime experience feel in this game. I don't think I've ever played a game where it feels so real riding around at night, to the point where it actually creeps me out. When you're riding around when it's nighttime, sometimes your horse will get spooked because of predators in the trees that you can't see. When this first happened to me, it scared the crap out of me, because I just heard growling in the trees but I couldn't see anything. So even still now when I'm riding around when it's dark outside, I always find 
find myself turning down my audio all the way down because I'm a bitch. But it's these details and elements of the game that brings the immersion to life because it generally feels like you're interacting and surrounded by real life people and just the world of it. Haven't seen any other game like it. Regardless of this, once Arthur and them get to Valentine, Uncle and Arthur head into the general store while Mary, Tilly, and Kieran head into the saloon. While we wait for them outside of the store, Mary Beth comes up to us and tells us that Kieran and Tilly are in trouble at the saloon. She tells us that they tried to rob a few drunk people without them knowing that they were in a bit of a scuffle. And as she's telling us this, we see Tilly getting threatened by another man. Get your hands off mm. her, friend. Who are you? A friend of mine. Get off her. Damn, Arthur. We then have to make our way into the actual saloon to go upstairs to save Kieran from getting assaulted by presumably a cracked addict. We've only been in this town for five minutes and these two have already gone domestically abused. Now after saving these two idiots from trouble, we get a pretty interesting scene. Some random guy comes up to Arthur and asks him, Weren't you in Blackwater a few weeks back? Me? No sir. Ain't from there. Oh, you were. Well, I definitely saw you with a bunch of fellers. Me? No. Impossible. Listen. Buddy, come here for a minute. I saw you. Come here. Cool. Get. I don't like this. Me neither. To which we chase him down in fear of him snitching on us. Just a word. We hunt him down to the point where he's hanging off a cliff. Arthur helps him up and threatens him that if he snitches on him, then he will most likely kill him. Though Arthur could have just killed him right there. Chapter 2 consists of probably some of the funniest missions in the game. For example, one of the missions requires us to get absolutely pissed drunk with Lenny for the sake of it. There's an entire mission dedicated to just beating the shit out of people. We go bear hunting with Hosea, where he acts like an absolute vagina. We threaten Thomas down for subsequently taking money from Strauss and not paying the debt, forcing Arthur to just beating the absolute shit out of him, and just so much more. In total, I probably spent about 15 to 20 hours in chapter 2 alone. It's where the gang is at its peak. Mike is also in jail for killing two members of the O'Driscoll gang while he was drunk one night, landing him a spot in prison. And I guess you can say that's the highlight of chapter 2, Mike being locked up and not appearing for most of the time. Our next lead to finding out to where Colm O'Driscoll's whereabouts are is Kieran guiding us to the nearest O'Driscoll camp that he remembered. We, Dutch, Bill, and Kieran make our way to Six Point Cabin, the last hideout spot that he knew that they were at. When we arrived, we shoot our way through them, only to find out that Calm wasn't there, showing signs that he probably fled the scene when we arrived. But even this would lead to Arthur accusing Kieran of setting them up and accusing him of being a liar. He ain't here. You set us up. Come here! What? You set us up. No, I didn't. You did. Come on, Driscoll ain't here. He was here, I swear. I, sw I mean, if I was setting you up, I, I wouldn't have <laughs> saved your life. It's a good point, Arthur. Man, he just can't catch a damn break. Though, finding Colm wouldn't be our biggest concern in Chapter 2, as we would deal with quite a few problems. In the mission, the first shall be last. We, Charles, Avier, and Trelawney are forced to travel to Blackwater to go save Sean, one of our gang members who had gotten kidnapped by a bunch of bounty hunters. And I also didn't mention this, but every shooter we have in this game has some of the most badass music ever. I count him with the epic feature where when you shoot someone from far away, it cuts to a badass shot of them taking a bullet. Which all of this just makes the experience so much more cinematic. Now, after saving Sean and completing this mission, this is when the game really starts getting interesting and picking up steam. So far, all we've done in Red Dead 2 is experience a bunch of character development, get a taste of what the shootouts are like, and have little encounters with the O'Driscolls and Pinkertons. Well, towards the end of Chapter 2, we begin to see the results of our consequences that we did in Chapter 1, like robbing Leviticus Cornwall's train. The first time we see this kick us in the ass is during the mission A Fisher of Men, where Abigail tells Arthur to take Jack Marston, who in this game is 4 years old now, out on a fishing trip since John Marston lacks the responsibility of being a father. Not my words, that's just what Abigail said. We take him out to a nearby river and begin to start catching some fish. And as we're packing up and getting ready to head back to camp, Andrew Milton, a high-ranking detective member of the Pinkerton Agency, shows up at the scene with Edgar Ross. He tries to make a deal with Arthur by saying that if he gives them Dutch Vanderlyn, then he and his crew won't bother them anymore for the time being. Of course, Arthur, you know, being a loyal person to clients of request. We want Vanderlyn. Old Dutch. I haven't seen him for months. That's so? Because I heard a guy fitting his description robbed a train belonging to Leviticus Cornwall up near Granite Pass. This leads to Arthur bringing Jack back to camp immediately and warning Dutch about this threat from the Pinkertons. And surprisingly, after Arthur tells Dutch this, Dutch actually doesn't want to do anything right away, suspecting that the Pinkertons want them to do something stupid, which is kind of an odd decision. Well, what do we do now? 
I say we do nothing just yet. It's just trying to scare us into doing something stupid. Now this is big trouble for the gang. It's the first time now where we see some of our consequences backfiring on us heavily, since we now have an entire agency on us, and now know where we are in the vicinity since we robbed Cornwall's train. Which all of this wouldn't have happened if Dutch has listened to Hosea in chapter 1, about not going through this plan of robbing this train. But it's clear that Dutch is all in this stuff for the money, and is willing to do these things without even thinking about the repercussions that it can have, which is a very common occurrence that we see throughout the entire game. Dutch just gets blinded by how much money they can make, so he puts his people in a great amount of danger for the sake of money. However, what really put the gang in even more deep shit was during the mission, The Sheep and the Goats. This mission starts off with John Marston and Arthur herding a bunch of sheep to Valentine. And once we arrive in Valentine, we meet up with Dutch in a little bar. That quickly escalates when we hear Leviticus Cornwall shout Dutch's name from outside. To which we see that they have John Marston and Strauss held hostage, leading to this crazy shootout right in the middle of Valentine. I'm telling you, if this was real life, they would be dead in a few seconds. But nonetheless, after we get Strauss and John Marston and Dutch away from the scene, Arthur is left by himself and has to escape the law. Once we evade the law once again, we're left alone. And starting here, we begin to realize that this is essentially the beginning of the end of the Dutch Vanderlyn gang in a way. Not fully, but kind of. This ambush leads to Dutch wanting to relocate, because it's only a matter of days before the Pinkertons find out where they're hiding at, since they constantly keep following us to keep showing up at random times. So to look for a new place, to set up camp, we and Charles set off to Dewberry Creek, where we scout out the area, help a family save their husband who was kidnapped, which leads to us having to take out a bunch of enemies that surrounded the area, and settle in Clemson's Point, which me personally is my favorite camp in the entire game. It's the only camp in the game that's located right next to a giant lake, where we can easily go fishing without having to travel somewhere else. And just overall, the atmosphere of the scene just gives off a very cozy vibe, especially when the sun sets. I mean, it looks freaking gorgeous. Now, chapter 3 is a essentially where we begin to experience Red Dead 2 pretty much in its true form. This is when we begin to start seeing the most action that we've ever seen in the game up to this point, as this is also the chapter where we see Sadie Adler, who we previously saved in the very beginning of chapter 1 from the O'Driscoll boys, begins to appear more and more throughout missions and becomes a very helpful member of our gang. Chapter 3 begins with Arthur, Dutch, Strauss, and Trelawney visiting the town of Rhodes, which is located very close to Clemson's Point. For context, Rhodes is a town that has two very powerful rival families the Greys and the Braithwaite. We find out that there's a big rumor going around that these two hostile families contain hidden gold that nobody has ever seen. Of course, Dutch finding this rumor out sparks that Big Lebrand is to begin to play both sides of these families in hopes of containing this gold that will make them a shitload of money. Falling out of rebel gold and marrying cousins or not marrying Arthur. That's Jose, you start poking around. See what you can find out about that. Rhodes honestly is a fairly underrated town in my eyes. The lore behind these two families despising each other, having hidden gold, and just the way the town looks with its orange sand gives off a very unique vibe than all the other towns in the game. And it's the only town in the game where you can't access any weapons, because you know, we're playing both sides of two rival families. But we finally join Sadie in the mission for the questions of female suffrage. I had honestly been waiting for like the entire game for Sadie to appear in a mission, since Rockstar had purposely excluded Sadie from the first two chapters of the game for a pretty good reason. In the beginning of the game, she was visibly shaken up and frightened from the entire situation and just everyone around her. Anytime you came up to her and tried to speak to her in either chapter 1 or 2, she would just give you a bitchy attitude and would tell you to fuck off, basically. But now, hours later in the campaign, she's somewhat calm, kind of. But I tell you, you keep me here, I'll skin this fat old coot and serve him for dinner! Watch your damn mouth, you crazy goddamn fishwife! Enough! And is now willing to go out with Arthur to visit Rhodes. And I think we can almost certainly see an immediate change in Sadie's personality once we get to Rhodes. When we arrive, Arthur tells her to go to the general store to get some supplies for the wagon, while he goes to collect the mail for Pearson. And she decides to pull a gun and threaten to shoot the shopkeeper. So, what's the plan? I shoot the shopkeeper while you- No! You insane! I thought we was outlaws. Outlaws, not idiots. That's definitely not the city that we saw in chapter one. And showing her different demeanor even more, while Arthur and Sadie are riding back to camp, the Lemoyne Raiders stop them and demand them to pay a toll for passing through their area. They're obviously being dicks and giving them a hard time about it, and Arthur is trying not to cause any trouble, but he would be accompanied by Sadie pulling the trigger first, starting an unnecessary shootout that's very close to camp. And what's funny to me is that during this entire gunfight, it's visibly clear that Arthur is stunned and amazed at the same time by Sadie just taking the lead and not being afraid of gunning down all of the Lemoyne Raiders so casually. 
actually. And I guess this is where you can say I kind of, you know, started taking a liking to Sadie. Just from the first true mission that she's in, we can already sense that she has turned from this scared person to an absolute badass fearless woman that takes no shit and is not one to be fucked with. There's so many times when there's giant shootouts, all of the men in the gang always try to make sure that Sadie is okay, since she's really the only female in the entire game that goes out on these dangerous missions, but every single time, she needs little to no help because she just knows what the hell she's doing, making her my favorite female character pretty much in all of gaming. I love how Rockstar didn't make her like the rest of the women like Tilly and Mary Beth. No offense, this isn't me talking shit on them. I'm saying that I like how they didn't just have all men doing business, but made the effort to integrate a female who is tough as balls and would do the amount of work that the rest of the men do in the gang. That's what I'm saying. Now, our next few set of objectives all revolve around getting to know the Braithwaite and the Greys, and just acting like straight outlaws. Some of the missions involve us robbing a payroll wagon that belonged to one of Cornwall's men that ended up in a bloody gunfight between them. We and Lenny steal some of the Lamorne Raiders' weapons. We take on an entire bank heist in Valentine with Bill, Lenny, and Karen. We steal more supplies from other gangs and also steal the Lamorne Raiders moonshine, which essentially is just a super hard alcohol in the game, to which we would sell all of this moonshine at a nearby bar in Rhodes, which honestly, this mission was needed and was a very good change of pace for gameplay because for the last few missions, we've just been going around and killing anybody around us. Oh wait, that's exactly what we do in this mission as well. Good evening, gentlemen. The Lemoyne Raiders bust through the doors and find out that, you know, we robbed them, leading to them attacking us in the middle of this bar. Thankfully, we and Jose managed to take them all out and escape the scene, because, you know, apparently no one can kill us in this game. But with that, we begin moving into the direction of the game where the Braithwaite and the Greys begin to catch on to us playing them. The first and major mission that involves us intriguing the Greys' property is in the mission to find yours of tobacco, when Arthur meets Jose and Sean and Mrs. Braithwaite's house, to which Arthur and Sean head out with tobacco in an attempt to burn down the Greys' tobacco fields. This mission overall is pretty neat. It starts off with Sean and Arthur riding to the Greys' property with a bunch of moonshine in the wagon, to which when they approach the area, Arthur hops on the back of the wagon wagon because their plan is for Sean to act like a completely new person to the area so that they can both get into the tobacco field smoothly since everyone there already knows Arthur. Once we get to the barn, we end up killing the guard and stake out there for the rest of the night. A few moments later, we begin to go around and douse all the fields with moonshine. I'll be honest, this mission took me a few tries because any sort of movement you make will make a dreadful sound that the guards will hear. Literally, the slightest muscle will cause the leaves to screech across the entire field. But once we douse all of the fields with moonshine, we set them up in flames leading to them alerting all of the guards in the area, leading to us fleeing the air with horses. Okay, let's get the hell out of here. Now, towards the end of chapter 3, this is where I would say the gang begins to start slowly falling apart. So far, we've seen the gang operate at his murderous outlaws that would do anything for money, in the hopes of surviving in this wild time period. And this would begin to start causing some of our own gang members starting to get killed one by one. This would all start with the Braithwaite and the Grace family catching on to us playing both sides of them. Every single time we visited them, we would always bring new people with us, which would lead to them suspecting that something was up. And not to mention, we robbed them all the time. Time. For example, in the mission Horse Flesh for Dinner, Arthur, John, and Avier arrive at Braithway Manor, and these guards have never seen John and Avier before, but they still let us in. We sneak over to the barn, kill one of the workers, steal the three horses, escape the area by defending ourselves, and sell the horses for a profit of $700 after demanding $5,000. I can give you $650 for them. <laughs> I was told we could get up to $5,000 for them. And I was told the moon was made of ladies' tears. In which, we would take a ride back down to Rose to meet up with Bill, Sean, and Micah. Micah tells Arthur that all four of them are going to head down to the saloon to meet up with a few greys on security jobs. But, as they're walking down the road, Arthur stops them and claims that something doesn't feel right. Which, I think we all know what happens. They were saying the Catherine Braithwaite... Hey, hold up. This don't feel right. Now it don't feel right? I could've told you... <laughs> The Greys randomly ambush us in the middle of Rhodes, since again, they caught on to us very quickly on us trying to play them. This ensues in the entire town attacking us, and in the midst of this, Bill Williamson gets kidnapped by Sheriff Lee Gray and his men. But of course, we're able to save him by taking out all the deputies, and from here, we're left with just a bunch of dead bodies. He was a good kid. Well, how the hell was I to know? Let me see. They set us up once before, 
They didn't like us. We destroyed their farm. Should I go on? Go easy on him, Morgan. He was out trying to find a lead. Same as you, same as Hosea. Now, upon arriving back to camp after dealing with this entire ordeal, we find out that the Braithwaite family had kidnapped and took Jack Marson away while no one was looking, which we can assume was probably for revenge. The game doesn't fully explain to us on how they got taken away or when he was even taken away, but it doesn't really matter how they got taken away because our next objective is to head over to the Braithwaite family his house to find Jack and kill every single person there. And this is probably my favorite mission in the entire game. From just the music that Rockstar uses in the opening scene just makes it feel so damn badass. And what also makes his mission so good is that this is pretty much the only time in the game where the gang puts their differences aside and all come together to find Jack. Which also really shows that yeah, they're bad people since you know, they're outlaws, but at the same time when it comes to kids, especially people like Jack, they're not gonna take it lightly. I'm gonna let fly at those sons of bitches! When we arrive, it goes exactly to plan. We slaughter all of the guards inside and outside of the house, but we don't find Jack unfortunately. But we do find Mrs. Braithwaite who's obviously, you know, crazy in the head. Jose and Dutch ask her where the boy is, to which she would say that her sons had given him to Angela Bronta who was located in San Denis. Where's the boy? My sons gave him to Angelo Bronte. So my girls, it's San Denis. So we take this information and leave Mrs. Braithwaite with her house burning down to crisps. When we get back to camp, John is obviously not in the right headspace since his kid is missing somewhere out in San Denis and he doesn't know where. And he mentions a bunch of times on how he hasn't been a great father to Jack since they've been out on the run. If I don't get that boy back safe, I'm... She... She'll kill us all. I know, but looking at this, logically... Well, that boy is fine. Conveniently, as we're having this conversation, the Pinkertons show up at our camp and threaten us to leave within three days. And if we're not gone, then they're just gonna kill all of us. But I came to make a deal. It's time. You come with me, and I give the rest of you three days to run off disappear and go and live like human beings someplace else. Which really does suck because I really did like Clemson's point. So chapter 3 ends with the gang moving from Clemson's point to Shady Bell and Dutch and Arthur taking a ride down at San Denis to check out the place, hearing about how much civilization was there and how built up it is. Big cities, they're always repellent. Exactly. I'll find you in there. Go see what you can figure out. Dutch tells Arthur that he's gonna give him some time to explore this place while he goes around to speak to the people of San Denis and leaves Arthur to see what he can find out where Angelo Bronte is. And that leaves us here. And good god is this place big. San Denis is the biggest town slash city in the game. Just by walking in this place, it doesn't resemble the Wild West in any way. It generally feels like you're walking through a massive corporate city. There's so many NPCs everywhere, people dress so formally, several buildings upon everywhere and just an astounding amount of detail put into it. Now San Denis is a great and detailed city, no doubt about it, but man is riding through this city just a clusterfuck mess. When I ride my horse down through San Denis, it's almost like I'm riding through New York City and I know what it's like driving through New York. Every single inch of this city is crowded with NPCs in these tight and narrow streets that I can barely get around without bumping into folks and because the wanted system in this game is so damn sensitive, you'll either get lawman after you or you're Arna Lovell will tank for just accidentally bumping into people. As good as the city is, it's just an absolute pain in the ass to navigate through. Fucking, it literally reminds me of how clusterfuck GTA 4's map is. And you wanna know something funny? During my first playthrough, I wasn't aware that Arthur grows facial hair over time and that you can actually get it trimmed at a barber shop or just at camp. So by the time I ended up in San Denis, Arthur had a full blown Santa Claus beard. But nonetheless, our main objective for chapter 4 is getting to meet Angelo Bronte so we could find out where the hell Jack is. And in the process of trying to find where he is by talking to different people around San Denis, we end up getting mugged by some children. Hey, hey, you little bit of shit. Let's go! 
If only Rockstar could let us kill these little bastards. We end up meeting Angelo Bronte in the very next mission with John and Dutch after retrieving our stuff. When we ask him where Jack is, he tells us that he's safe and he will give him over to us, but he wants us to go out and clear out a local cemetery yard in return for Jack. So with really no other choice, we and John go out and annihilate all the graveyard robbers, and thankfully Angelo Bronte wasn't bullshitting us and gives Jack Martian back to John. And when we arrive back to camp with Jack, there's then this little party where the entire gang sings together in celebration for Jack returning. Now, in chapter 4, we get quite a bit of action, and really start seeing the gang start falling apart way more. Throughout this chapter, we see Dutch turn from this role model that Arthur and the gang looked up to for guidance, to this crazy deluded man that began doing a lot of uncharistic things. For example, when Arthur, Dutch, and Lenny robbed the San Denis bank, where Bronte had told them where there was a bunch of money stashed, only to find out that there was barely any cash, and instead they were kinda just set up by him, later in the game, Dutch instructed the entire gang to hunt down Bronte and kill him, and when Dutch does finally capture him and kill him by forcibly drowning him to death and feeding him to alligators, Arthur's perspective on Dutch begins changing a lot. It ain't nice, I know it, but it is us or him. I figure it might as well be him. realizing that he started to do a lot of things to become the person that he hated and told everyone not to be. And with Dutch's actions changing more and more throughout this chapter, leads to him doing a lot of things out of Spike that causes more and more trouble for the gang, that evidently leads to them getting ambushed by Pinkertons and O'Driscolls all the time. Hell, the O'Driscolls would show up and surprise attack us right at our camp. That led to Kieran, who is probably the most innocent person in the entire gang, getting his entire head chopped off. What is that? What the hell have they done to me? Look, they're in the tree line. And Hosea, who was Judge's closest friend, would be killed as well. He had gotten killed when we had all robbed the San Denis Bank again, which turned out to be one of the most gone wrong missions in the entire game. People like John Marston would be captured by the Pinkertons, Lenny would get killed right in front of Arthur, which was highly unexpected, and I was literally speechless when it happened. It wasn't like we knew it was gonna happen, like, it just happened. And this chaotic bank mission ends with the gang escaping on a ship that gets destroyed by a storm, leading to Arthur, Dutch, Mike, Bill and Avi are getting stranded on the island of Guarama. Have a drink. Have a drink. Somebody yeah. give him a goddamn drink! This section of the game, chapter 5, isn't really my favorite part of the game if you want me to be honest. The entire chapter just feels like filler because they needed the gang to have somewhere to go and show how Dutch's plan backfired on the gang tremendously. And for me at least, it feels like Guarma is trying too hard to be like Mexico in Red Dead 1. But on the island, we do a bit of protection for Hercule how do you say his name, who's a soldier of the island. We help him in four missions, he helps us get a boat to get back to mainland America, and that's all we do on Guarma. Like, I'm not even joking, that's literally all we do. This entire section just feels rushed in a way, mainly due to just how short the missions last, and how much it just doesn't actually correlate to the actual story. It does in some way because time is passing while Arthur and the rest of them are on the island, while the gang is waiting for them to come back, but the premise of it is cool, you know, on a completely deserted island, but I feel like this section is just really, really underdeveloped. From the game not letting us free roam and explore the entire map, to just how different it is from the entire rest of the game, leads to it being vastly overlooked. However, entering chapter 6 of the game, this is where I say the game begins becoming more of Red Dead Depression. Huh. I didn't steal that at all. Chapter 4 and 5 really begin to display the gang starting to crumble due to some of Dutch's actions that really bites them in the ass. And in chapter 6, all of these crimes that they've done so far, robbing and murdering people from chapter 1, 2, and 3, which are all things that they thought they could put behind them and move on, displays the results of all of these consequences really coming to reality for them and basically displaying how much the Dutch Vandal gang has fallen apart. Kieran's dead, Lenny's dead, Hosea's dead, Sean's dead, John Martian had gotten arrested by the Pinker during the bank heist, and basically everyone hates each other. You're drunk again, and you're a fucking murderer. Good morning. I the rules. She did no such thing. She was in love. You sour-faced old crone. Goddamn you, murderer! Murderer! All right, love. 
You're all murderers. Shut up. It's very clear that Arthur has pretty much lost all faith in Dutch, since it's clear that Dutch only cares about himself, and is not the same Dutch that he remembers being around. I mean, we can perfectly see this when John Marston is arrested and is potentially gonna get hanged for his actions, and when Abigail delivers his news to him, he doesn't show any sort of concern for it, or even says what plan he's gonna do to break him out of jail. What are you gonna do about John, Dutch? John? He's in jail. Well, we'll get him. Abigail, just not, not yet. There's talk of hanging him. It's not gonna come to that. Dutch! Not now, Mesa. Not now. Which, if this was Dutch in, let's say, chapter 2 or 3, he would have rounded up everyone immediately to go save John with no questions asked. But this dilemma of looking out for his people and just trying to rack up as much money as possible is pretty much destroying him. And might I add, we would also find out that Arthur had contracted tuberculosis, which would leave him with a short window of time before it kills him. Which, for pretty much the rest of the duration of the game, in the back of our minds, we already know that Arthur is gonna eventually die at some point. We don't know how, but we know he's gonna die. Which is what makes chapter 6 even more depressing in a way. After every single mission, Arthur coughs up more and more uncontrollably, and it gets to the point where you can't even feed him without him yakking it all out. And all of these issues and problems that Arthur is now seeing around this broken gang and realizing that his time is on the clock leads to him wanting to do something meaningful, since I mean for his entire life basically, he's been following orders from someone who he thought was a father to him. His end goal is just him wanting to go and save John Marsden and just get him and his family to safety and just help the rest of the folks in the gang. To live a somewhat normal life, because during the entire game, their lives have been anything but normal. Abigail, Jack, John, make sure they make it. I mean, this whole thing is pretty much done. I also think this chapter is what really displays Arthur and Sadie's chemistry and bond building closer. These two basically have the same personality in a way. I mean, I mean, they both have the same end goals in mind and are super loyal to each other. They both know how much Dutch has changed and is not the same person that they knew before. He and Micah just have Arthur do all of these crazy shenanigans that aren't helping the gang one single bit, but instead are just drawing even more unwanted attention from Pinkerton than it already needs to be, and even showing multiple signs of him just straight up not even caring about Arthur in certain situations. Situations. Dad, I need help. I need help. Sadie and Charles seem to be the only two people left in the gang that really ride with us to the very end. Sadie helps rescue John out of prison, to which John would reveal to Arthur that Dutch had actually seen him get taken away by the Pinkertons during the bank robbery, but for some reason he just didn't do anything to save him. And when Dutch finds out that Arthur and Sadie had broken him out of prison without him knowing, he and Micah act as if they were in the wrong for doing it and that they messed up, even though if no one acted as quickly as Sadie and Arthur did, then John was most likely gonna get hanged. You are my son. I was coming for you. They, they was talking of hanging me, Dutch. They was talking. They was talking. And now they may come and hang us all. This is also just showing how much Dutch is siding with Micah more and more, even though that Arthur has been with Dutch for 20 years and Micah only riding with the gang for 6 months. But reason being is because Micah is basically a yes man to Dutch and will just basically glaze the fuck out of him, unlike Arthur who has now lost all faith in him because he's now seen just how much he's changed and just how he isn't himself anymore. And Dutch does not like the fact that Arthur isn't siding with him anymore. And by the time Arthur figures out how screwed up everyone is in the gang and how everyone has basically betrayed him in every way, Arthur has pretty much already decided that the entire thing is just not worth it anymore, and that he has really nothing to lose. The best thing this game nails at when it comes to writing is Arthur Morgan's redemption. Of course, in the early stages of the game, he's been with Dutch for pretty much his entire life, and he's always been following orders from him by living this complete life of crime, by just going around and just robbing innocent people that have zero involvement with anything. But now, they're in deep shit with the Pinkertons, O'Driscolls, getting into other people's business that aren't theirs for the sake of it, and when he sees how much if all of Dutch's actions are backfiring on them, and how he's just not thinking rationally about his behaviors anymore, he starts thinking for himself for once and wants to help other people get out of all of this. And by the time Dutch realizes all of his failures after Arthur successfully gets John Marsh to safety, it's already too late. He realizes that Arthur was right the entire time about Micah being just a complete snake, and how all of these shenanigans that he was doing were going to eventually catch up to them. If you got the high honor ending, then it truly displays what Red Dead Redemption 2 is. My first playthrough, I had the low honor 
around the ending, where Micah just shoots Arthur in the face after Dutch leaves. Which, I honestly thought that was the only ending of the game, until I looked up on YouTube and realized that there were two separate endings, and when I found that out, I was just like, god damn it. And if you haven't already played the epilogue, then you should definitely give it a try, because it's an amazing experience. As you know, it's a part of the actual story completion, and it's really unique because it explains what John Marston's normal life was like before the events of Red Dead Redemption 1 unfolded. But that being said, the way Rockstar perfects the writing of this game is really one of the things where it's really only a Rockstar thing. Not trying to sound like I'm absolutely throating Rockstar here literally bent over backwards. They're able to make a story so deep with characters that feel so real and just get you incredibly connected with all of them. And at the same time, not making just a super generic plot, which you don't typically see in many video games nowadays because a lot of companies just aren't willing to go the extra mile of making a super compelling story, which I mean, of course, there are companies that have made games with super deep storytelling, like The Walking Dead, The Last of Us, God of War, to name a few. Not that I've played any of them yet, just heard good things about them. But it requires a lot of thinking with writing and planning. Therefore, many studios just aren't willing to do that and just want to focus on the fun, batshit, crazy gameplay aspect. Which is not a bad thing, because Rockstar literally did that with GTA V. But that being said, Red Dead Redemption 2 obviously isn't a perfect game. It's definitely my favorite game of all time, and will be for quite a while. But I'm not going to sit up here and act like the game doesn't have its own issues. Things like incredibly forced gameplay, the fact that New Austin in the epilogue is dumbed down than Red Dead Redemption 1. I already mentioned how New Austin and Red Dead 1 is already bare bones enough just because it's just a giant desert of nothingness forever, but places like Armadillo are my favorite locations because it perfectly represents the classic western towns that you could have very much imagined in any Wild West movie back in the day. But New Austin and Red Dead 2 is drastically different. Places like Armadillo are just completely dead with very few people left in it, making it just a useless piece of territory in the game to explore. I was super excited when I got to the epilogue because now I could finally visit New Austin as John Marston instead of always getting gunned down as Arthur, but when I got to these landmarks like McFarland's Ranch, Armadillo, they just felt very, very underwhelming than what I was expecting, which I guess is my fault for getting my hopes up too much. To be honest, there's no real reason to visit New Austin in this game unless you're just trying to compare both games to each other. As much as I love the character movements, they can feel very, very stiff and annoying at times just for how realistic they are, but still. John Marston, for obvious reasons, isn't fleshed out and is pretty bland with his personality in Red Dead 2 than how he was in the first Red Dead of Redemption with his badass personality of just taking zero shit from anyone and just being a sarcastic person all the time. Considering that Red Dead of Redemption 2 is portraying him as a more naive younger outlaw brother to Arthur. And lastly, the fact that Guarma in Chapter 5 just felt useless for the entire plot of the game. Or I shouldn't say useless, but more so just not utilized enough. Like, we only get about an hour of playtime on the entire island, it barely lets us explore it, and the only way to access Guarma is by getting up to Chapter 5. I should probably also throw in the witness slash wanted system. They are quite literally broken in this game. However, all of these issues that I just stated in the game that are very apparent are very small and don't discourage the gameplay at all. But I'm glad that even though that this game is widely considered a masterpiece in the public view as the best open world games out there, we don't just live in a Red Dead 2 circle jerk and are able to criticize it, unlike GTA 4 fans. Yeah. But with that being said, I have tried my best to carefully go through each of the Red Dead games in this series, to how they've evolved over time from just this little 3D Persian arcade style shooting game, to a complete overhaul of the open world environment that we know today. I'm not gonna say it's the best game ever, because if I did, it would be completely subjective. But whether you love or hate the game, you can't deny that it beats a lot of games when it comes to world design, a character development, and its deep, deep level of storytelling that quite literally goes above and beyond the player is sunken into the experience. I don't think we'll ever see a game like Red Dead Redemption 2 unless we see what GTA 6 will turn out to be like, and if Rockstar will eventually make a Red Dead Redemption 3 in the future, even though we don't know what it would be about. Honestly, the biggest problem with Red Dead Redemption 2 is that current Rockstar doesn't bother to make any single player DLCs like they did with Red Dead Redemption with Undead Nightmare and just their older games, because, you know, GTA Online pretty much took over any single player love. Can't believe I dumped a thousand hours in that shitty game. I also was originally gonna talk about Red Dead Online as well, but I played literally 10 minutes of it and dropped it because I could give two shits about the online mode. It just feels like a bland reskin version of the base game that's not fun nor entertaining at all for me, since Red Dead 2 has literally everything you could ever want in a single player game. From just casual gameplay like hunting, fishing, a bounty work, or just 100% of the entire game, it's very rare to see in most other video games. Shit, I mean I've dumped close to like 300 hours in the game and still find single player much 
much more enjoyable than anything else. But thank you all for watching to the end of this video. This was my first 1 hour plus retrospective video on my channel. Still not too sure exactly how long it's gonna be. But any feedback or criticism for how I could improve my writing and things would be appreciated. I'm trying to start making more longer in-depth videos about the games I talk about. Mainly because it just gives me more time to actually explain why I love or hate certain parts about a game. And just gives me more time to get my points across. So pretty much expect longer review slash retrospective videos in the future. Sorry this video took forever. This was my first video this long. So hopefully I'll get faster with producing these lengthy videos from here on in the future. And my next video by the way is San Andreas. So stay tuned for that. Thanks for the support recently. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day. And I'll catch you guys on my next video. See ya.